Good evening, friends. I'm very happy to be in the Long Island, New York area again, and to see many friends sitting here, and some new friends come in. Would those who have never seen or heard me please raise their hand? Thank you. Welcome, new friends. Very happy to meet you. I have just uh, been informed that I have spoken at hundreds of places. You are also informed just now. And I sometimes wonder, what are those hundreds of things that I have said? Because at all the places I say the same thing. Maybe I use different words here and there, but what I share with you is so simple, so easy. So consistent so far as I can see, there's nothing much to add to what I've already said. And all I say is that the truth, that the real knowledge, that the awareness of who we are, our own self, and our purpose, all this truth and knowledge is within ourselves. That all the answers to all our questions are already there within ourselves. All we need to do, do is go within and get those answers. Actually, that is the end of my talk. <laughs> the rest is an elaboration of the same thing. Why do I need to elaborate? Because by habit and nature, we are used to visiting every other self except our own self. By habit, we are using the power of attention, which is the only available power of consciousness that we can handle, that we can manipulate, that we can use. The power of attention is being used by us to scatter ourselves all around, all over the world, in the whole universe, everywhere except within ourselves. We don't seem to have time to put attention on ourselves, but we have plenty of time to poke our nose in everybody else's business and to study everything else going around and not see what is going on inside us. Why have we got into this habit? We don't blame anybody. The nature of this universe is such. It is based upon the concept that manifestation requires time, space, and cause and effect. This is the basic definition we give to manifestation. When you say create something, we automatically understand you create by putting it in time, space, so that it can be made a sensory experience, an experience of perception. That if we cannot perceive what we have created, we have not yet created. That we can only say we have a creative power in us if we can create something to see, to feel, to sense. That sensory perceptions are a must to experience our own creativity and our own creation. As a result of that, we are constantly looking for evidence of our creativity. Evidence that we are doing something worthwhile as living conscious being, and that evidence we are seeking outside where our senses can reach. We open our eyes and we see what have we done, what have we made, what have we done to this world, what have we done to ourselves, what have we done to our body. We look around with the eyes, but with these eyes, we look outside of ourselves. We want to see what kind of music, what kind of notes exist how the birds chirp and how the bells toll and we open our ears and listen outside. We see, we hear, we touch, we taste, we smell outside. We never use any of these perceptions to see who is seeing, who is listening, who is touching and tasting and smelling, who is the self. Who is the experiencer of all this creation? From, from where is this being manifested? When a person 
opens the eyes and looks at something, he assumes the thing must be there, otherwise how can you see? We give definitions to these senses based upon this basic fallacy that creativity must manifest outside in time and space. We give reality to this world because we want to look at it as real. If we don't want to look at it as real, we might start thinking, do we see a thing because it's there? Or is the thing there because we see it? And is there any difference in the two statements? We don't stop to consider this. Here is a cup of water. Is it there? And then I see it and touch it and taste it? Or do I see it, touch it and taste it? Therefore I say there is a cup of water. And what's the difference in the two? There's a basic difference. In one case, the causal direction of experience, of sensory experience, becomes the manifest creation outside. The cause is a world existing outside and the effect is my being able to experience it. On the other hand, if my seeing and experiencing is leading to the experience of the thing, then the causal direction changes. And the ability of consciousness to be conscious, to experience, makes those things real. Which is correct. Because of our growth from childhood till our present ages, on the assumption, cause and effect, time and space, we want to verify, confirm the truth of the causal direction by a simple test. The test of time. Whether the cause comes first or the effect comes first. By definition, cause comes first, effect comes later. Therefore, if this piece of paper exists first and then I look at it, then the paper was created first, the experience of the paper was created later. If on the other hand, I see the paper first and then I say there is a paper, then the experience of the paper in my consciousness was the cause and the effect that the paper is real is the, is the effect and therefore it follows in another direction. A common fallacy is to think that if I don't have the paper in front of me, I put it behind me, I can't see it. When I bring it in front, I can see it. Therefore, obviously, the paper is the cause of my seeing it. There is a little catch somewhere. The catch is that when we go to sleep at night and have a dream and in the dream we see a paper and we want to establish, are we dreaming about the paper or is it really there? We might still see the paper and say, the paper, I couldn't be dreaming of the paper, paper is there, therefore I am dreaming of it. And if the question comes, no. Maybe you are dreaming of the paper because you are a dreamer. And I can then in the dream put the paper behind me and say, no, the paper is not there. Now I can see it, so the paper is real. It's not dreaming. And when I wake up, I find not only was the paper part of the dream, the very act of hiding it and bringing it was also a dream. The very act of verifying if it is a dream or not was part of the dream. That the fallacy lay that the dream state could not be investigated by the cause and effect of what was happening in the dream. In the same way, we cannot investigate the causal direction of manifest experience outside just by saying, are we seeing first and then things come up or are things there and therefore we see? If you examine it very carefully as a personal experience, you will find that the timing of the seeing of a thing and the thing being known to you is identical. It's the same time. Nobody has ever known a thing to exist and not experienced prior to the experience. 
nor has any thing lasted beyond the experience. So the experience of a thing and the thing are the same. So long as we are conscious beings having experience only through the sense perception. The sense perceptions make us look at a world which could be a world projected entirely like a super dream. And it will look as real so long as our level of consciousness remains at the same consistent wakeful state. Just like if the level of consciousness is at the same consistent dream state, it remains a dream. There is no way to prove it otherwise till we wake up. So the question whether this world exists independently as a material world of atoms and molecules in which we made up of also similar atoms and molecules having a brain that can pick up through the life process the power of consciousness, the power of receiving these images and receiving these impulses in the sensory system can experience this world, whether this is actually happening or that consciousness itself is creating the whole show and implanting upon this show the laws of the atoms and the molecules and to make it more real and whether they are simultaneously taking place or not cannot be determined except if there was a possibility of wakefulness to a higher level of consciousness which would reveal whether this is happening by our creation or it is already created and we are merely small tools to experience part of it. This question has been examined by philosophers and both views have been expressed. The theory of idealism is as old as Socrates and Plato who said the world of ideas, the world of thought, the world of consciousness within is more real than the manifest world and it all comes from there. And it has gone on to the materialists who believe that matter is real, consciousness is merely a function of a material brain. Both sets of philosophers have propounded their theories. In the midst of this have come some practitioners whom we call mystic adepts who said we don't want to study philosophy or theory we want to study consciousness. And they discovered the reason why we became philosophers was we assumed the manifestation of a universe outside and continued to study that universe outside. We did not go into the question of who is experiencing this universe outside. The experiencer was not examined sufficiently and the experience alone was analyzed. So they changed their direction of investigation and said instead of examining what is happening outside, examine the self, examine your own self, examine what the self consists of and you will get answers to these questions that you have been discussing in philosophy for so long. When they examined their self, it was a totally new experience. They had never been through that experience. They did not know that to examine oneself, one has to go within. Nobody knew how to go within. Nobody knew what was within. They closed their eyes, sat in meditation, sat in a dark spot and continued to look at the darkness in front and said, we are inside but it is all dark. Actually, they were still outside. Their attention, riveted to the power of seeing with the eyes, was still proceeding outside. They shut their eyes put the eyelids in front, couldn't see and thought they were inside. But all the time, what they were watching was the darkness outside. How could they go inside? And they called it meditation. And they thought that they were now examining the self. But the self was still looking out in the same way as it had looked out with the eyes open. How can the self start knowing more of itself with eyes closed when it could not know itself with its eyes open? And that's all they tried. Therefore, the key to going within was provided by some lucky people who hit upon an experience called withdrawal of attention. A rare experience. Attention was known to be part of consciousness that we can focus on something. You put your attention on the wall 
and your whole mind, your consciousness goes there, you become acutely aware of the wall. You put your attention on a person and that person becomes real and you begin to have experience of what that person is doing or saying. But withdrawal of attention was unknown. You could focus attention on a cross, on a dot, on a circle. You could close your eyes and try any kind of meditation based upon focusing of attention and you continue to be outside of yourself. It was a rare experience for these few lucky ones who hit upon it, perhaps by chance, perhaps by design, but once they hit upon it, they became the secret guides, the secret masters, the living masters, the perfect living masters who could tell us that focusing of attention can never take us within because all focusing is outside of the self. Focusing itself is a process that takes the attention away from your own self to that where you are focusing. Therefore, reverse this. Withdraw your attention to yourself. And they gave some techniques for withdrawal of attention, which were so beautiful. Basically, the technique was to think of where you were operating from. Where were you? Where are you? Not go anywhere, not focus on something. Just stay where you are. Pull back more of yourself to where you are. They made it a nice technique how this can be done. Using power of imagination, using power of repetition of words, using power to control the mind in certain ways, to look within, and above all, using the power of listening. The greatest power they found human sensory systems had, which could help them to discover their own self, was the power of listening. That if they started listening, that the power of listening, of hearing, could become so strong, they could listen to anything. If you shut off every sound from outside and listen, you could listen to your blood vessels, you could listen to your heartbeat, you could listen to all the functions, physical, physiological functions in the body, and then as you listen intently within the head, do nothing but listen inside, you would listen to the resonance of the sound of bells. You would listen to the sound of a music which seems to have no beginning and no end. That there was a music in the self itself. This was a new discovery. And the music was there all the time. And they found out that whoever listened to the self, not put it, focus the attention somewhere, but listen to oneself was automatically withdrawing attention to oneself. And the listening capability enabled one to withdraw attention to oneself and see what consciousness is all about. And that led to the experience of the self as against the experience of the manifest creation outside. The experience of withdrawal to the self and listening to the music of the self was so great an experience opened up the light of one's own self. For once, they could discover that what they saw with the eyes was not the eyes seeing. What they saw with their eyes was the self seeing limited by the eyes. They found what these ears were listening to in the past was not the ears listening, but the self sitting inside listening through the ears and confined to how much the ears can listen. They found that the very organs of sense reception and perception that they thought were attached to the body, which were giving them that experience of the world, were themselves limiting the experience of the world. They were limiting experience, period. That the sensory apparatus of the self was much stronger, much greater than what they had seen outside. So this was a great journey within. Instead of journeying outside, Instead of journeying to distant places on pilgrimage, on discovery of truth, instead of going to various churches and temples and denominations of various kinds to discover the truth, they found the only real temple, the only real church to look into was this human body and the consciousness that resided inside. The more we went inside, the more truth we discovered. And as they went inside, they found layer after layer of one's own potential and one's own nature. 
and they found that within the system of a physical body, the senses operate caged in, that they are the prisoners of the body. That if the body was not caging them in, that one could be with one's own self, the senses can float away and work on their own, that they were not dependent on the body. This was a very strange experience for them. They had assumed while in the prison house of this physical body that to see, you must open these eyes. When they went inside and listened to themselves, they could step from the body and still see, thus proving to themselves that it was not necessary to have the body to see, that seeing was themselves, that seeing could move, hearing could move, all the perception could move away from the body and still retain a full consciousness of the self. Just like the body gives us an identity, this is myself, that package without the body continue to have the same identity, continue to be the same being. And other things happened. When this shift took place, the memory cleared up and the cobweb that was created by the physical body was removed and one could remember this body was only temporarily worn by me. It was like a garment, like a jacket that I could be moving around without this body. That I was in fact moving before I took the body and the memory became clearer to remember when the body was taken off. The memory became clearer and we could see a lot more. They could see so much more of their own self. And yet, the senses that moved along also looked like a body. Because they walked in the same way they would walk with these feet and see that the feet are not there. The senses operated almost like a body. So, just for the sake of definition, they gave it a short name to that self, that new form that they discovered. They called it the astral self, the sensory self, the self that is sustained by senses and does not need physical matter to experience anything. That was a big, a big leap jump into a knowledge of the self that the self was not confined to the physical body. But they did not stop there. Some stopped and said, we found the truth. The truth is, there is a soul that moves into the body and moves out. It's called an out-of-body experience. And that's all you need. But some did not stop. They wanted to make sure if we could be misled for so long that the physical body was our self, then the astral body is our self. Couldn't that be just another cover like this body? Is there any proof? Is there any way to verify or confirm if the astral body or the body of senses without bo a physical body is also not merely another cover? They tried the same experiment again of going within short system that they withdrew their attention in the sensory body to the point from where the senses were operating, from where they were picking up the manifest creation outside. And as they withdrew their attention within the sensory body, they found they could, just like they had left the physical body and walked out, they could leave all the senses intact and walk out. That senses were not giving them the mobility and the locomotion to move, that consciousness which moved was quite different. In fact, when they moved away from the sensory body and left it behind, they realized that whenever they thought we are not here, they were not there. When they thought they were somewhere else, they were somewhere else. That they could fly at an immense speed, at the speed of thought. And whatever they thought became reality. This was too much of an experience that the thoughts of the same being that was trapped in senses and physical body could become the creation of the manifest reality. And they found that basically the human consciousness was thought, was that abstract thing called thought and does not require either that very fine thing we call senses or the dense thing we call this physical matter or physical body, that consciousness not only can survive, but can have direct 
recollection of memory within that self, within the mind of that own self. The mind is still intact in all these forms. The mind has not gone. Identity has not gone. The connection with the self has not gone. The previous link has not gone. And yet, the conscious self is operating without the sensory or astral body and without the physical body and discovers that thought is a thing. Thought is like a real entity. That thought is the self. So many of them were so happy to find this. And they stopped there, having found the ultimate knowledge. That ultimately, it is not body or senses that takes you to the reality. The reality is the self is a thought. And that thought creates everything. Whatever you think becomes a reality. That is the process of creation. They were very happy. And we call them great yogis, Mahayogis in the East, and they were given different titles all over. That they were the realized people who had realized the nature of the universal mind from where all thoughts came and all thoughts created all creation that we were experiencing. In this rare academy of a few people who discovered that thought could be the self and they practically saw it, not by philosophy, but by practical experience. Amongst these adepts, some questioned the very fact that thought could also be merely a cover. How are we so sure? We were so sure with the physical body that is the self and we found it wasn't. We were so sure the astral, sensory, flying body in space, consisting of senses, was the self. It wasn't. How are we so sure that thoughts are really the self? So these rare ones, we are getting into a very rare club, exclusive. There's very few mystic adepts who did not rest content with discovering their thought process and their thought self, said, let's go within. At least one thing they discovered, that all thoughts occupied time and space and proceeded in a logical cause and effect framework. That gave them a little suspicion that if this framework of time flowing in which thoughts are placed, if this framework is so rigid and is not created by thoughts, but is being used by thoughts, to place experience in, there could be something more fundamental, more true of our own nature of creativity, that the creativity is not coming merely from thoughts. So they went within thoughts. How did they go within? They saw where the thoughts were emanating from. And they withdrew their attention to the melody of the self within those thoughts. And lo and behold, these rare people, human people, like us, but with that intense desire to seek the self. These human beings were able to penetrate themselves and finding the own self could move just like that, move out of an experience they used to call thoughts. That was too much. That thoughts were not us. That thoughts could take place and we could still get out and not have any thoughts. That thoughts were being used by us like a body, like senses. That thoughts were just another body, another vehicle, another cover. But this thought business was so strong and explained all the creation, whatever you thought came into being in time and space, that they called that body the cause of all experience below in senses and physical systems. And so they called that body the causal body being the cause of all manifestation. The cause of all manifestation was the causal thought body, the mental body, the mental self became the cause of all creation in time and space. But then who was the self that moved out? They discovered the self was still a conscious entity, a conscious being that gave consciousness and life to thoughts and therefore to senses and therefore to the physical body. That consciousness per se still existed and was not dependent upon thoughts. And this discovery of consciousness, which was hidden under the covers of thoughts, senses and body, physical body, this discovery led them to what they called self-realization. The self was then realized that self is pure consciousness, pure ability to experience. 
does not require time, space, and cause and effect frameworks. That it creates this framework. And once it creates the framework, it creates a mental world. And the mental world proceeds with thought. And those thoughts create the sensory apparatus and the sensory experiences, the senses, the thoughts, and consciousness put together, enter into a physical body, and make this the self. They discovered the whole truth about how these covers, if taken off one by one, could lead to the knowledge of one's own real self. This process of finding out the self inside these covers, they gave a very strange name. They called it dying while living. Why did they call it dying while living? Because they assumed when they saw people dying, that people lose consciousness of their bodies. When we look at a person who is dying, we see a person functioning in, in a physical body and after a while, that physical body is nothing but a heap of matter and that real thing is gone. So from that point, they felt that if we could leave this body and find out who we were, it would be like dying while living and then come back into the body and tell them we did it. Tell other people, other friends who are interested. If anybody else is interested, we can share this experience that by going within, you can experience the same thing that happens when a person really dies and leaves the body. Except we can do it at will and come back and share the experience with you. This dying while living, referred to by several mystics in different cultures all over the world. Nanak in India says, there is no spiritual realization unless one can experience dying while living. Paul says, I die daily. You could find references from the Upanishads, even the Vedas, to most modern literature about the possibility of withdrawing attention and making this body as good as dead and thus discovering what is inhabiting, what is living inside the body. This process of dying while living was merely a way of remaining in the body but becoming so unconscious of it that it was as good as dead. Now, if you want to experience, is there a self inside this body that is more permanent than this body? What are the options for us? One option is die and see if you're still alive. If you die and you look and the body is dead and you are still around to watch it, you have got proof. But then it's too late. They may have burnt you or buried you before you get a chance to get back. The other alternative is don't tell them what you're going to do. <laughs> and go within and practice withdrawal of attention. If you have seen a person dying slowly, some people die quickly, heart attack, stroke or something or accident. We don't know how they die. But if you have seen people dying slowly and talk to them, you will notice that the first signs they have is they don't know where their hands and feet are. They are still talking to you. They say, what's happened to my hand? Can you place it somewhere else? They don't know where it is. They don't know where their feet are. As if they are losing consciousness in degrees that they are unaware of their extremities. As the death proceeds, they get more and more unaware of their extremities right up to the top of the legs and the end of the arm. They're still talking to us. As they keep on dying, they keep on talking, they lose touch with the body. They're not sure if they're flying or they're on the bed or they're somewhere else. They lose the tactile sense where they are. They're still talking to us. And when they die right up to the brain, they're gone talk no more. It looks like the process of dying is like pulling out consciousness, pulling out awareness from the extremities of the body right up to your brain, the center of the brain behind the eyes where you seem to be speaking from in a wakeful state where you're opening your eyes and looking out in the wakeful state. It appears the process of dying takes us through a withdrawal of awareness right up to that point and then we slip out. And since everybody dies, suppose it must be a very universal experience. What did these mystic adepts, the practitioners of dying while living do? They decided to see when we withdraw attention, not by concentrating on a point, but withdrawing to your own self from where it appears you are watching all points. 
close your eyes instead of looking at the darkness experience where are you looking at from thereby creating a withdrawal when they did the yoga of withdrawal of attention to their own self and continued to carefully intensely put their attention on themselves after a while they did not know where their feet and hands were they lost consciousness they didn't know they opened their eyes to see they thought their hands were hanging like this but actually the hands were like this like they sat the hands became unconscious the feet they could not know where the feet were very similar signs to dying as they proceeded to put their attention upon themselves within after a while they didn't know where the body was they felt they were flying maybe they were half way up in the room they had to open their eyes and see that they were still on the ground some of them got up from there who had no master no teacher no guide they got up and ran and said we are not going to die it is terrible they thought they were really going to die in the process of a yogic practice they got so close to withdrawal of attention and therefore getting unconscious of their physical body that they got frightened this may be real death but actually the experts had done it every day they do it every day every morning every night we think they are going to sleep they merely withdraw their attention and fly and have a journey into a different dimension they are not in touch with the body they leave the body but we get trapped and we don't take that risk but if taken under the guidance of a master one would find as consciousness is drawn and goes towards the third eye center these two eyes being the physical eyes the point behind them from where we are putting the images together from where we are putting questions from where we look here or there from where we feel awake and living that point third eye center when attention is focused there we become unconscious of this physical body and yet fully conscious of ourselves and discover what wakefulness from the physical state means we are dead virtually dead in this body and yet alive so this process is called dying while living and this process gives us a key to what our real self is in fact there is a little story a parrot story which is told in india and sometimes i share that story to relieve the burden of a heavy sub subject there was a merchant who used to do the business of import and export he used to export indian silks and indian cashews and other things to africa and bring some spices and other products from africa into india every year he made a visit to africa to buy things and sell things and then he would bring the merchandise and sell them back at home in the course of his journey in africa he used to pass through an african jungle and there were very beautiful birds there especially these parrots parakeets have you seen any beautiful parakeets with lovely green red colors a very beautiful birds he used to admire them and one season during his business trip he decided to bring one of these birds with him to india so he bought a cage and during his trip he captured one of the birds put it in the cage and brought it to india in india he fed that bird with a lot of nice goodies chilies and special kind of candies that the birds like and he had a good recipe and that parrot was so happy the parrot laughed and danced and sang in that cage and enjoyed himself next year when the merchant was going back to africa he asked that parrot in the cage hi i am going to your home country africa do you have any message to send to your folks back home and the parrot in the cage said yes tell them i am enjoying myself in my cage i eat drink dance laugh sing i am keeping merry in this cage i am having a good time so the merchant left and he went to africa and there he called all the birds in that jungle when he reached there and he said gather here do you remember that i took one of you with me to india one parrot he has sent you a message and his message is he is enjoying himself in his cage he eats drinks dances sings is making merry and is very happy in the cage when the merchant said this 
One parrot sitting on the branch of a tree got tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. The merchant became very sad that this parrot must be very close, a dear friend of the parrot I took home and therefore he has died, he could not bear to hear the message. Anyway, saddened by this event, he came back home. When he reached home, he told the parrot in the cage, Look, I conveyed your message to your folks back home that you are enjoying yourself in your cage, eating, drinking, making merry, laughing, singing, all that I conveyed to them. But when I said this, one of the parrots, who must be a dear friend of yours, he had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. When the merchant said this, the parrot in the cage had tears in his eyes and fell down dead. And the merchant said, Oh foolish fellow, if you knew that that parrot could not bear to hear the message, why did you repeat the message here? Anyway, saddened by the second event, he opened the cage and threw the dead bird out. As soon as he did that, the parrot got up from there, flew and sat on top of a tree. And the merchant said, So you aren't dead after all? And the parrot said, No, I am not dead. Nor is the other one dead in the African forest that you saw. He only sent me a message through you. And the message was, If you want to get out of this cage, die while living. <laughs> we, when we die while living and continue to die in different bodies that we are experiencing, we can find our ultimate reality, consciousness by itself, the soul of a human being. The soul is not the same as the mind. The mind operates from the causal body, from the causal self. The mind operates with cause and effect. The mind operates in logic. And it has to be logical before we will accept it. If the mind makes an illogical statement, we reject it. So mind must be consistent in a logical way on a cause and effect basis. Whereas the soul, which provides consciousness and life to the mind, has no such rule. Here we are, inside ourself, this physical body is a sensory apparatus that gives us the power to see, touch, taste and smell. Consciousness is divided into different forms of experience. The experience is inside, it looks like outside through this power that we have. Inside that sensory apparatus is the mind, is the mental self, is the causal self that creates these experiences in time and space. And all these bodies, physical, sensory and mental, Take their sustenance, get alive because of the existence of the self, which is soul, which is our spirit, which is our real true spiritual self. That true spiritual self is not dependent upon cause and effect, is not dependent upon senses, is not dependent upon this physical body or its life. That true spiritual self or consciousness or the soul is immortal, has no birth and no death, does not follow any time frame. The mind follows a time frame. A mind can be millions of years old. The same mind. The soul which is immortal can assume a role in experience of a million years of mind. And the same mind keeps on gathering memories, gathering memories, coming again and again into experiences of various kinds, creating all different forms of incarnations. And the same mind can use different sensory systems. The sensory system may have a life of a thousand years, two thousand years as known to us. And those two thousand years may be spread over five, six, ten bodies, physical bodies. So when we sit here thinking this is a self, we forget that inside this self, which is not going to last, say, more than a hundred years, this self about a hundred years old will die and has to move on. But the sensory self, which has the same power of seeing, the same power of hearing, continues and may continue till that dies. And when it dies, it is still not death. And when that dies in millions of years, the self is still the same that gets the power of consciousness 
to that mind and was immortal and never was born and never will die. This truth is in, inside us. This is not made by man. No inventor or scientist put this package together. The creator put this package together and each one of us felt it. The resonance of the self inside the mental self, inside the sensory self, inside the physical self, that resonance is a natural melody, a natural music which enables us to go back. It is so natural, so much a part of the self that it is sometimes called the self. In fact, if somebody were to ask, what is the ultimate self? The question is, you have, people can question me, Ishwar, you have today exposed that there are many covers. How do you know the self that you say is the self may also be covered? Indeed, at an early stage I found out it was a cover. That even the so-called spiritual self, which has no covering on it, but is pure consciousness, also is a cover. What cover? The cover of individuation. The cover that it is one and therefore separate from another one. That in fact you could get over that cover also and discover that in truth the self is not one self, it is totality of self and there is only one consciousness that has set up this whole shape. As you come to the creator's definition, as a single creator who is the total consciousness, who exists in everything and everything is in that creator. That definition comes by totality of consciousness. Somebody may say, we can find something even deeper. How do you define the ultimate self, the total self? How do you define it? And we go back to the nature of that self at all levels, that it can be heard. And therefore, we can go towards it. It is audible. It is not spoken, but can be heard. What word can we find can we find any word for something that can be heard and cannot be spoken? We tried very hard. People have tried in every generation, throughout history, in every culture, to find a word which would describe the power of consciousness that can be heard but not spoken. And for want of any other word, all cultures, to the best of my knowledge, used the word word to describe it. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. See? And the word was God. It is said in the Vedas 10,000 years earlier. It's not occurring first time in the Bible. In St. John's Gospel. It is said in all cultures. Go and see. The sound. The unstuck music. The unheard shabad. The sound without beginning and middle and end, this unspoken language is the ultimate creator and is the nature of consciousness. But when we want to discover our own self, it has been described as something that can be heard but cannot be spoken. Thereby, in a human being, we could find two things. If we want to lead a spiritual life, what do we have to deal with? We deal with two things in our head. The speaking self goes on babbling, goes on thinking, goes on telling us what to do, goes on telling us what to remember. The speaking self in the head, in the listening self that keeps on listening. Did you know these two represent the mind and the soul? The soul never speaks, the soul listens. The mind never listens, always speaks. Here we have a combination in ourselves that if we keep on talking, we'll never find the truth. If we stop talking and start listening, we'll find the truth. It's the listening device inside that can take us to our own self. Incidentally, I wondered if this arrangement made by the Creator and natural to us, which no man created, has been there in all human beings ever since human beings existed in creation. Such an arrangement, if it is used outside, would also be helpful. And I find even in human day-to-day -day affairs, if we became more of listeners and less of speakers, it will help us a lot. Because we tend to speak a lot more than we listen. No exceptions. <laughs> the point I am making is that this ability 
to come to one's own self beyond the logical mind to that part of the self which is pure consciousness gives us an insight of what would be our nature, how would we act, what kind of creativity would appeal to us if we saw it without these lenses and these covers of other bodies upon us. And then comes the beautiful experiences that we would have if we looked at the world spiritually, if we looked at the world with our soul unfettered by the mind, unfettered by thoughts, unfettered by senses, unfettered by the physical body, unfettered by the relationships of the physical body. If we could see the world with the soul alone, what would we see? We would see love. Love comes only from there. No amount of thinking, no amount of mental activity has ever given the experience of love to anybody in the world. And yet love is a universal phenomenon, universal experience of the soul. If you could keep your mind and senses aside, what would you experience? Love. What is love? Love is the identification with another because one realizes at that level that all consciousness is one. It is automatic. You don't learn it. If you could keep your thoughts in check, if you could keep your mind in control, you would automatically, without trying, experience love. The identification with another. The identification of the self. What else would you experience? Intuition. Intuition. A sudden knowing. Not thinking quickly and knowing. A knowing without thinking. A knowing without cause. A knowing without time. A knowing without duration. That knowledge, that hunch, that sudden gut feeling that comes from nowhere. Comes from nowhere except our own spirit and our own soul. The mind cannot make it up. You can think as long as you like and never have intuition. In fact, if you think hard, waiting for intuition, it will never come. Guaranteed. Intuition comes when your thoughts are somewhere else. And that intuition flows through from the soul. Intuition and love, these two qualities of human consciousness are arising from our basic self, from our spiritual self, from the soul and not from the bodies that cover it. The bodies, in fact, destroy it. Every day, I find from place to place, from country to country, people complaining, we had such a beautiful love. But you know, so much, more we thought about it, the more it got destroyed. Thinking about love instead of developing it, tended to destroy it. Why? Because thinking by its very nature, by the logical process it occupies, creates fear and doubt. If you find a person very certain and sure of himself or herself, try and make that person think a little longer, half an hour, and the person will be very unsure. Same person, make the person think of the very thing of which he or she is sure. Thinking has its nature of creating a fear, because the more you think, the more you discover you don't know. The more you discover how little you are knowing on the basis of which you are thinking. The logic exposes our area of ignorance. Whereas the intuition doesn't depend upon this. Intuition gives a flash of certainty. You say, I know it. Somebody says, how do you know it? I don't know how, but I know it. That's intuition. But when you say, let me grab intuition to solve my problem. I have a problem now. Ah, here it comes. That's not intuition. That's the mental gymnastics. That is trying to use the logic of the mind in a quick way. It doesn't make for intuition. Intuition is spontaneous. Does not take even a millionth part of a nanosecond. It was not there and it is there. Even the smallest thought takes time. May take one second, may take more. It takes time. Intuition never takes time. Every thought has a cause and an effect. Intuition never has a cause and no effect. It's just part of our being that we get to know this truth through intuition. And so, same is the case with love. When we have the experience of love, we have a feeling for someone so strong, it comes from nowhere, comes spontaneously, has not been thought out by us. It doesn't grow, it cannot be cultivated by thinking. Thinking often destroys that relationship. Therefore, our spiritual self, 
which is made up of love and intuition as its faculties, as its functions, and consciousness or the power of awareness as its base, when these are put together and we realize, have a self-knowledge and self-realization, our whole life changes. The creativity coming from this source is so pure, so wonderful, so beautiful. A person who leads a spiritual life and spends more time with his or her soul than with his mind looks at the whole world with a sense of awe and beauty. And everywhere such a person travels, people love that person without knowing that person, without being introduced. And they wonder that person had something. That person had nothing except the person was himself or herself, was living with the soul and not cluttered by the thoughts of the mind. The thoughts of the mind are what make us distrust each other. The person says, I love you. Do you love me? It starts from there. And then it says, say it again that you love me. Say it ten times so I'm sure. <laughs> these attachments, these relationships of I and you created by the mind, which are called attachments, we want to give it the good name of love. That is not love. Love is when you forget I. A person in love with a person, A loves B. Real love would make that A believe in B, B alone and see nothing but B and feel nothing but B. A is forgotten in the process of love. In the case of attachment through the mind, which we call love, A comes first. If A loves B, A says, I love you. I is number one, love is number two, you are number three. <laughs> What's the position of the beloved in that? And if by chance, A who says I love B, B happens to say, but I don't, then A says, I hate you too, within, within a few seconds. This kind of attachment based upon mental activity does not represent our own self, does not represent our soul. Our, this is not the quality of our soul. It's the quality of a computer which we are misusing and identifying with and therefore leading a life which is not really a spiritual happy life. If we recognized ourselves, our life would become happy. If we use the mind instead of being used by it, our life would be happy. Why do people come to the spiritual path? These mystic adepts found that some people are so busy in the world, they have no time. And some are rushing to find out the truth. The real cause they found in this world for people turning to spirituality was unhappiness. And although people looked happy from a distance, and some were rich, some were prosperous, some had big homes, some had big cars and limousines, they looked so happy and prosperous. When you spent two or three days with them in their own home, they cried bitterly with their own unhappinesses, their emotional problems, their great pain of different kinds nobody could see. And these mystics found that it is the unhappiness, the rejection of this physical system that makes people turn inward and look for spiritual success. So when a person is feeling unhappy with this world, and everybody is unhappy, if you examine closely, then we want to turn to something that is more real. And nothing is more real and permanent than our own true spiritual self, which is immortal. So that is how the spiritual path is a great way to remove the unhappiness of the world. While we were driving here, my friends who were in the car were discussing a very interesting point. That if this world is known to be unreal, how can we enjoy it? Well, we have enough evidence given and pumped into this world of senses to make it look real. But a man of awareness, a person who has achieved self-consciousness and self-realization, that person can get to that state or this state at will, can fly like a bird. Therefore, when this world gives happiness, take me happiness. When this world gives unhappiness, switch to the other level <laughs> and find out it is not real anyway. <laughs> of course, uh, the question was still open when we reached here, how to operate the switch. <laughs> but these mystic adepts have given us this nice way that do not always get 
do not always <laughs> the creative power of the self if some of you are coming tomorrow to the workshop how many of you will be in the workshop thank you those who have raised their hands and will be here tomorrow we are going to see how that creative power of the self or the sound current or the word or the inner consciousness how that can be realized and what its power is and how it affects everything how listening to that itself can give us so much happiness that the listening to our own self is such a joyful experience that we can take care of most of our problems of the world by listening to that we'll get some taste of it some sampling tomorrow we'll uh, uh, go into that question and also see how the switches operate at different level <laughs> i would be uh, amiss if i did not mention that when we talk of intuition and love there is a third element which is equally important in the nature of the self and that is beauty all of them give us a lot of real joy beauty or aesthetics in a real sense when we look at the beauty of creation of manifestation also comes from the self the craftsmanship of the mind cannot give us the aesthetic experience that the soul gets therefore the mind of a human being has the experience of picking up the sensory perception which is called sensing churning it around in the mental system which is called reasoning and then crafting it into new patterns and new forms which it calls as creativity but this creativity of the mind is nothing compared to the intuitive power of the self the love that it can experience and share and get oneness in this world and the beauty of that totality it experiences through the spirit the two things are different and i would commend a spiritual path for anyone who feels that there is time to turn away from the unhappiness of the world to the happiness of the joy within thank you very much thank you i shall be very glad to answer any questions on the presentation i have just given you or on the presentation that i failed to give you can ask any question uh, and those who are going to be here tomorrow if they wish they can give a chance to others and ask their questions tomorrow but uh, if there's nobody else asking you can ask a question yes that's a very good question that uh, we dealt with the uh, juxtaposition of these two uh, theorists the idealists and the materialists and uh, whereas i moved on to the idealists and assumed i done a good job with them i forgot the materialist that they have an agenda of dealing with the material day to day real problem of the world problem of miseries pain suffering Uh, prisons crime uh, hospitals the real problems third world countries poverty there are so many problems does it mean that by taking the stance of accepting one view of creation or manifestation is it a escape from the uh, hard realities of facing the material problems my answer is no if you know the truth you face these realities with much greater strength and much greater courage and knowledge you deal with them more effectively why are we here the question will be even from the point of view of an idealist why are we here in the material world in this pattern what is our role and once they can find that the role was set by a pattern they can know exactly how to perform that role and they perform that role without so much diffidence and lack of confidence therefore the material challenges that come in the life of one who has this realization are met more effectively and are dealt with appropriately the other aspect of this question is that why should i assume my position of idealism why not assume the opposite position of materialist that the materialist world is real why not start from that taking that assumption and holding on to it the materialist world of matter is real we are real the rest is just a concept and a speculation and how can we handle this i did that once 
I tried to re-examine my entire position based upon the assumption that the material world is real. And all this is a great power of suggestion, a great power of make-believe in which we can get this inner strength. And I ended up by finding that the real material world, I enjoyed more, I became more happy and dealt with people much better. It made no difference. So I came to the conclusion that I could take a number of assumptions of what is real. I could take the materialist point of view as real or the idealist point of the real or somewhere in between, merge the two and take a mixed reality. Whatever assumption you make, the fact that you can discover yourself and the power of consciousness does not diminish your ability to deal with each of these assumptions. And therefore, if you think this world is real, this physical being, the man is real, he becomes a much better physical being and a much better physical man to deal with the physical reality. So the process of self-realization that came to us from these mystics became equally good and equally useful even in the assumption of a materialist world with real materialist problems to take care of. Well, if there are no more questions and comments, I'd like to thank all of you for your patience in listening to me and look forward to meeting you, some of you again tomorrow. Thank you and good night. God bless you.